Hello, everyone. This is Serious Trivia, and starting this week, we are starting a weekly speculation series for Total War Three Kingdoms 2. Of course, even this name is tentative, as we simply have not gotten any news or updates from Creative Assembly after the pre-production announcement a year ago. While I personally think we are still a couple years away, there have been quite a few requests recently asking me to share my thoughts on the new title. Now, for those of you who don't know me or are new to the channel, here's a little bit about myself to explain why I feel qualified to share my thoughts on the development of this new title. Firstly, this channel was created back in 2019 when Total War Three Kingdoms was first released with the sole intention of covering the game. And as I have been a longtime fan of the Total War franchise going way back to Medieval 2, and as a native Chinese and a fan of history, the Three Kingdoms setting finally motivated me to start a YouTube channel, which was something I have always considered doing but never actually did. Since then, even though the channel has diversified to many other games, Total War Three Kingdoms have remained a staple on the channel, as I racked up over 2,400 playing hours on the game over the course of the last three years. This means on average I spend close to three hours a day in the game, whether it is recording Let's Plays, hosting tournaments, or just doing research for guides. Combined with the fact that I also happen to be well-read on the primary sources covering the history of the Three Kingdoms, I would describe myself as a power user and an expert on the game. And over the course of my content creation experience on YouTube, I also had the honor of joining CA's content partner program, which has granted me early access to their games and a few opportunities to be the voice that shares patch updates with the community. This means whenever Total War Three Kingdoms 2 is set to launch in the future, I will certainly be involved in its pre-launch announcement and almost certainly be under an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement. Therefore, I figure the best time to start this speculation series is probably right now, rather than closer to launch. And my hopes for this series is to not only share my thoughts, but also to spur community discussion in the comment section below in order to provide some feedback for the development team who are currently working on the game. Lastly, I need to clarify that although I am in the Content Partner Program SCA, I have zero contacts with CA's marketing and development teams, so I know just as much as you do in regards to the details on this future title. So everything said here represents only my personal opinions and speculations. With all this said, let's move on officially to the topic of this week, which is why Total War Three Kingdoms ultimately failed and how the next title can avoid the same fate. Now, when I say failed, what I'm referring to is the abrupt end to the support of the game and the decision to pull the plugs on all future potential DLCs. The reason for this, although never clearly stated by Creative Assembly, boils down to two main issues. First and foremost, DLC sales were not matching internal expectations. Secondly, the reason why internal expectations were probably high is because the base game was the best-selling Total War title of all time. Therefore, we got the abrupt, simultaneous announcement a year ago of the end of Total War Three Kingdom support and the beginning of the pre-production of a new Three Kingdom-based game as it became clear that CA as a company still wanted to cash out on the Three Kingdom IP but realized their current DLC strategy was suboptimal. So instead of continuing to dump resources for minimum returns, they decided to burn their bridges with their existing fan base in hopes that all will be forgiven in a few years' time when they bring out a new and hopefully better title. Now, the purpose of this series is not to trash CA for this decision. And if you're the type that hold grudges for a long time and have sworn on your first child, to never buy the remake, then good for you. You have my blessing, but personally, I'm still looking forward to the new title as quality Three Kingdoms games do not grow on trees. 
after seeing the decline in both the Dynasty Warriors and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms franchises, which remakes their game every few years anyways and charges the same fan base over and over again for essentially the same game, I honestly don't think a Total War Three Kingdoms 2 is such a bad idea, granted it improves on the first game. So the most important thing I believe the remake need to figure out in order to be successful is to have a solid DLC strategy, as financial results will dictate the longevity of the game. So let's first take a look back at how DLC was being planned for the original Total War Three Kingdoms. When the base game launched on May 23rd, 2019, there was the Yellow Turban pre-order DLC that featured He Yi, Huang Shao, and Gong Du that added the first subculture in the game. At the time, bandits were not a separate subculture, and cross-recruitment was not allowed between different subcultures such as the Yellow Turban and the Han faction, probably as a means to create this sense that the Yellow Turban content is locked behind this DLC. So if you want to play as the Yellow Turbans, use their generals, or recruit their units, then you have to buy the DLC, or get it for free by pre-ordering or purchasing the base game within the first week of launch. And judging by the initial sales, this was a good DLC strategy, even though it did create a few problems historically, as they were a few former Yellow Turban officers who would go on to work in the Han factions after the rebellion failed. But that is a rather minor point, and something we might save for a future episode. For now, let's fast forward to June 25th, 2019, when the first major patch, patch 1.1, dropped. I'm going to mention all the major patches here, because they play an important role in my suggested future DLC strategy for the remake. Now 1.1 was your typical post-launch bug fix and stability patch, with no real new content. Then on July 16th, 2019, Eight Princes was announced as the first post-launch DLC for Total War Three Kingdoms, set to release on August 8th, 2019. And immediately, the community exploded in anger, as historically high sales of the base game also meant that most of the player base are new Total War players drawn in by the Three Kingdoms settings, yet the Eight Princes is set 100 years after the beginning of the base game. Now this time, there was no plans for so-called chapter packs with different start dates, and CA probably planned this DLC quite early on in the development cycle based on the success of their previous East Asian-based historical title, Shogun 2, and its DLC, The Fall of the Samurai, which did so well that it eventually became its own saga title. However, CA was no longer dealing with the same audience, and even though the time jump forward is something shared between the two DLCs, the technology offered in their respective settings is vastly different. The best-selling point of the fall of the samurai is in the time jump itself. It was the introduction of the American rival in Japan, and thus more advanced gunpowder-based weaponry that included Gatling guns, naval artillery, added to a predominantly katana and bamboo yari spear setting in the Shogun 2 base game. The only difference in terms of military technology featured in the Eight Princes setting is the cataphract. And to make the matter worse, Three Kingdoms focus much more heavily on individual generals when compared to Shogun 2, who basically had every single general look the same on the battlefield, as a regular cavalry officer with one of those nice big balloons on their back to catch arrows. So the shift in time frame made the game that was already low on unique characters at the time have even less unique characters, as the Eight Princes DLC only feature the Eight Princes as unique characters. Add on the fact that the Eight Princes Rebellion was not only an obscure historical event for Western fans, it was equally obscure even for the casual Chinese history fans. As a matter of fact, the only good thing that would come from the Eight Princes DLC is that it would inspire me to start the Let's Talk Lore series on this channel. Then on August 6, 2019, right before the launch of Eight Princes, we got the patch 1.2 announcement, 
which features some key free content, such as the cataphract, mounted crossbow, and heavy mounted archers, as free units that will be added from the DLC to those that owns the base game, even if they do not purchase the DLC. In addition, 17 new generic armor were being added into the game to help create the illusion of less generic generals, as you would have slightly different looking armor added to their faces. In my opinion, the unit inclusion was a kind gesture by CA, and they probably felt confident that no one was really buying eight princes for the units anyways, so they could give them away as sort of a goodwill. As for the 17 new generic armors, that was a stopgap to appease the community to give them more time to work on more art for unique characters. Then on September 25th, 2019, we got patch 1.3, which featured the first group of free unique characters updated for everyone, where Guo Jia, Huang Gai, Jia Xu, and Pang Tong became legendary characters with their own unique artwork and abilities. While the base game sorely needed this at this time, in a future remake, because so many existing artworks already exist, I would suggest not doing this for free, as unique character additions can be a really attractive paid content for the game. Of course, I hope CA will not become overly greedy with unique character sales and charge too much for them, but a faction-focused character pack would do quite well, especially if they focus a bit more on minor characters of less played factions. For example, we can argue that the current roster of unique characters, which is well over 100, already captures most of the important early period characters, and there's really no reason to redo the artwork and model for them unless we get a really drastic update in the engine being used, then perhaps you want to refresh some of the models. But regardless, I just don't think it's a good use of the resource. Instead, in the future, if we have a slightly minor faction, say Yuan Shao, and you come out with the character pack featuring 10 or so minor characters to really enhance the experience of players who like to play this faction and charge a reasonably price for this pack, then I think it would do well. Obviously, this would have been impossible to implement for the original game, as by this time, there were maybe roughly 30 unique characters in the game, but for the remake, we have the advantage of having the 100 plus characters already made, and this is a good opportunity for both CA and the fans, as without monetary incentives, many of the minor characters would simply never get unique artworks and models in the game. This does mean that CA would have to maintain a generic copy of all characters for players who do not make these purchases, as character packs will essentially lock some of these unique artwork behind DLC. But this is not a technical challenge, as character mods already work the same way. For example, if I have MTU installed, then I get a unique artwork and model for certain characters compared to if I don't have MTU installed, then I'll get the generic version. So there should be no conflicts here in terms of how to implement these DLCs. But continue with our timeline. We can fast forward to January 14th, 2020, when Mandate of Heaven, the first chapter pack DLC was released, alongside patch 1.4. And I think here is where things started to go wrong for the game in terms of the DLC monetization strategy. The DLC exclusive was the 182 start date, and six new factions, including three Yellow Turban Brothers, and Liu Chong, Lu Zhi, and Emperor Liu Hong for the Han. And there's nothing wrong here, as six new playable factions is quite a lot for a new DLC, even if you consider all three Yellow Turban Brothers technically share the same roster of units and mechanics. But aside from a few bugs that took quite a long time until the final patch to really address, the Mandate of Heaven DLC was actually a tremendous value, as the 182 start date also included all the base game factions for the most part, as going back in time will not run into any issues with historical death. Not only this, patch 1.4 was the Imperial Court patch, where all the players received the Imperial Court mechanic, along with all the new diplomatic options for the Emperor. 
Liu Biao also finally received his own faction unique mechanic centered around his governance resource. Two new siege engines in the multi-bolt crossbow and the siege tower were added to the game for free. Deployables and thoroughbows were all added for free, which included defensive towers, wooden stakes, deployable oil, cow traps, and smoke screens. Every unit included in the Mandate of Heaven roster, including the Imperial Army units and the three Chang Infantry units, as well as the six new Yellow Turban units, were all given to the players for free, regardless if you purchased the DLC or not. In addition to all this, we got another four free characters in Lu Zhi, Huang Fu Song, Diao Chan, and Xun Yu for everyone, even if you did not purchase DLC. Oh, and we also had Tao Tian as the first free LC Lord, and another free faction with a unique mechanics and two unique units all for free. In essence, my point here is that CA quickly shifted to a chapter pack strategy after the failures of the Eight Princes DLC. And the selling point of the DLCs became this new start day idea with new factions. And thus, all the core game mechanic changes, which is where all the value is located, became free patch updates. This made the base game of Total War Three Kingdoms an incredible value for people entering the series late, especially during sales, as even without purchasing a single DLC, you will not miss out on any of the core game mechanic changes, which is not how most game companies do it. Take Crusader Kings 3, for example, since they just launched their Fate of Iberia DLC last week. If you don't buy the DLC, you don't get the struggle mechanic in your games. And playing in the Iberia Peninsula with or without the DLC is a night and day experience. Aside from this issue, the fact that Three Kingdoms is a historical Total War game means that once you start moving forward in the timeline, the map becomes more and more unified. And instead of gaining new factions to play in these new start dates, the number of available factions will actually decrease over time. So the value proposition for each new chapter pack becomes lower and lower while the game is still improving because most of the core mechanic changes and existing faction mechanic updates are given out for free. And at the end of the day, this is essentially why support for the game ended. Because if you continue down the timeline to March 12, 2020, the launch of the next DLC, A World Betrayed, along with patch 1.5, you will see that we only got two new factions in Sun Ce and Lu Bu instead of another six, like in Mandate of Heaven. To be fair, CA outdid themselves in terms of how well these two factions play as their faction mechanics are simply amazing. But once again, what really improved the game at this point was patch 1.5, which was the Bandit rework patch. In this patch, we got not four free legendary characters, but we got eight in Chengpu, Zhou Tai, Da Qiao, Xiao Qiao, Cheng Gong, Gao Shun, Zhang Zhao, and Zhang Hong. In addition to these, we also got eight free tertiary characters that have unique art and model for the campaign, but are not available in custom battle or multiplayer. And these included Wang Lang, Yan Yu, Li Jue, Liu Yao, Ji Ling, Lady Bian, Lady Mi, and Xu Shu. In terms of game mechanic changes, we shifted away from a salary-based satisfaction change to titles, which added quite a bit of historical flair and strategic options as each title had its own bonuses. Then of course, there was the Bandit rework, where Bandits became its own subculture with unique generic character skill trees, new buildings, new reforms, new units, new court positions, new tax structures, new army stances, and a new loot and contract mechanic that really separates them from the Han factions, which has been a huge community complaint since the launch of the game. And Spies also received the overhaul in this patch with the turncoat mechanic to make it more useful. Jama Jian was the only free unit, but there was also a map change to populate the south, which was largely empty in the base game on launch, and even population was reworked to now provide bonuses to all income, additional construction slot at certain milestones, while the whole map got a historical makeover with each settlement getting more accurate starting population and fertility levels. And I almost forgot, there was a free LC that was Yan Baihu. So yeah, once again, a lot of free stuff. 
Then on August 28, 2020, we got a different type of DLC in an expansion pack called Furious Wild, which added the Nunmun factions for most of the existing chapter pack timelines, as well as the base game timeline, where we ended up getting these four new factions and an entirely new subculture, along with its own mechanics and units. And this was probably the best DLC from a monetization point of view at this point, since the new content is actually all locked behind the DLC. And the only free content we got in patch 1.6 that came along with it was a map update to expand the southwest where the Naman faction existed. Gate passes were added in and a few new commanderies were created. There were only three free legendary characters included in this patch, namely Wei Yan, Xun Yu, and Li Ru. And the problem here was after giving out so many free characters in the previous patch, once this patch was announced, people actually got disappointed as there were only three free characters this time around as A World Betrayed had 16 free characters. And this could have all been avoided if Character Models becomes a paid character pack in the future. Just saying. Every existing faction did get a new faction leader background trait, which was nice, but it was not really a new mechanic change for the game. There was also only one free unit in the fire-breathing juggernaut, and the free LC faction this time was Shi Xie, who aside from having a family related mechanic that could generate you resources to make these special sets of chest items, it didn't even have a unique building or unit. So in essence, what we got here was a DLC that actually did not give away the house in the company patch, but because so many free quality updates were provided before, people were legitimately disappointed by the free content this time around as it was a big drop off from the prior patch that had the bandit rework. And then finally, on March 8th, 2021, we got our final DLC in The Fates Divided and patch 1.7. This was once again a chapter pack set in the 200 star date. This time, there was only one new faction added in the Liu Yan slash Liu Zhang father son combo faction. And given that we have moved on to year 200, many of the base game factions were already destroyed or absorbed and are no longer playable in this chapter pack. Many new units were added for Cao Cao and Yuan Shao's factions as they are the main characters of the battle of Guandu which was highlighted by this DLC, and these new units are in fact locked behind the DLC. If Total War Three Kingdoms actually had an active multiplayer community, then this might have been a great selling point, as many of these new units are top tier multiplayer units, but unfortunately Total War Three Kingdoms does not have an active multiplayer scene, so there really was not much present in the DLC itself. The patch, once again, became the highlight of this update cycle as 1.7 brought the new Imperial Intrigue mechanic, significant updates to Cao Cao and Yuan Shao's faction mechanic that basically got reworked, a new and improved faction council that allows for long desired things like re-rolling character traits, and a customizable faction rank up system that allow you to adapt your rank up bonuses to how you want to play out your faction with prestige points. The Han Emperor could finally be properly restored, and we got 10 free legendary characters in Wen Chou, Yan Liang, Yuan Tan, Yuan Sha, Zhang He, Yu Jin, Cao Ren, Cao Pi, Lady Zhen, and Fa Zheng. There was however no free LC added along with this DLC, as I'm sure the internal developments of the game was already winding down, with their main focus on bug fixes to leave the game in a playable condition with no future support in sight. So after going over the history of Total War Three Kingdoms, my hope for the remake is to have a different DLC strategy to allow for better monetization of the game for both CA and the consumer, and thus extend the longevity of the support for the game in order to make it a truly great Three Kingdom based game, because there are so many little things that CA did well in designing Total War Three Kingdoms and it's a real shame to see it end this way. So here's what I'm going to suggest. Have the base game set in 190, like currently, and instead of selling chapter packs, provide the start date positions for free. It doesn't even have to be set dates. You could just change the map starting position for different factions to reflect every single year if you want to, 
and it doesn't take a lot of work. But don't provide the factions as playable in every single start date, because that's overkill and really unnecessary. What you should do is, because Three Kingdoms have a problem in that factions like Sun Ce and Lü Bu can't really exist on the 190 map, and honestly, Meng Huo shouldn't exist until 220 either. So instead of trying to sell preset dates where you're trying to fit every single faction possible on the map, only sell factions with new, unique mechanics designed for certain start dates that will be made available to players who purchase these DLCs. For example, we have the 190 base game Liu Bei. Which might have the same mechanic he has right now, militia focus, unity focus, but a 207 Liu Bei should have vastly different mechanics. He will probably be focused on survival and alliances, just like a 221 Liu Bei or Shu faction at that point will be led by someone else with a different mechanic with a different goal. So instead of adding on new mechanics every time you redo a faction, you sell the DLC. That allows you to play the same character or the same faction, essentially, with a completely different mechanic that is designed for the scenario of that start date, and you don't have to populate the entire map with playable factions for every single start date. Certainly, Lü Bu and Sun Ce shouldn't be playable until, say, 194, but just because they're interesting in 194. Doesn't mean every other faction are interesting in 194. So if I have to play, say Cao Cao in 190 and Cao Cao in 194, and make it feel the same, I'd rather not. So just add the interesting factions in the interesting dates with interesting mechanics, and sell that as DLC instead of selling one set date. So we can run through a few more examples just so you get a better feel for this. For example. If we play Sun Quan in 207, which is a popular day since Trippy happens there, he might be focused on the mechanic of defending his land, of allying with Liu Bei. But if you play Sun Quan in 221, he's now looking at a betrayal with Liu Bei and setting himself as becoming an emperor. So he might be having completely different mechanic, and essentially we can have. The three kingdoms faction of Shu, Wei, Wu, and run through different dates, and they would have different leaders. Each of those dates would have different mechanics, even if they have the same leader. So, for example, a 221 Shu faction mechanic would be Zhuge Liang being the faction leader, balancing between taking care of Liu Bei's son, setting up northern expeditions as sort of a historical route, as a loyalty route. And balance that with more of a selfish route, where you could have Zhuge Liang ending up, you know, taking control of Shu for himself, building a separate kingdom for a better chance at a long-term victory instead of wasting their resources annually on those northern expeditions, just to keep, you know, the restoration of the Han going. And for Wei's faction, you might have different periods of Cao Cao earlier on, more of a build-up mode, and after Guan Du. You're sort of in a domination mode, and then after 220, Cao Pi takes over with entirely different mechanics. That's no longer, you know, scheme based, but maybe something that balances the interests of gentry clans and the interests of his family. There is just so much potential here, and you could also introduce minor factions much better if you can control their existence in only certain time frames. For example, Ma Teng is only interesting. If you play him during the Liang Rebellion, Ma Chao is interesting. If you play him during his rebellion, any other date, it doesn't really matter. And if you do want to play them, CA could allow it, but you don't have to design a new mechanic for it. So you want to have distinct mechanics that defines their historical goals at certain key points in the Three Kingdom period. And you want to sell those interesting mechanics to the consumer rather than selling a date. That's how I feel the game should move forward, and allows for minor faction to exist in reasonable places with reasonable goals for alternative history 
So Yuan Shu could exist, you know, during his road to declare himself as emperor. Gong Sun Yuan can exist to try to create the kingdom of Yan and so forth. And you know how we had Dong Zhuo as skinny Dong Zhuo and fat Dong Zhuo for Man of Heaven and the transformation to the fat version as a tyrant? Well, Dong Zhuo can exist in his early days as a skinny model or a younger model, actually. And he could be fighting yellow turbans and down rebels for the Han. And then if you play him in 190, he's a tyrant. He has the older, fatter model. And this is another way you can sell those character packs alongside these individual factions at different start dates. You can have older models of the same character with different artworks being sold. And if you purchase this DLC and you choose to start with the 190 or earlier date, once you transition to a set year, your character automatically shifts to the older model. So you have a transition of age, which is something a lot of players want. But this way you can add it and monetize the work that you put in to create those newer, older models, and the player will still feel good about it. So these are just some ideas. I feel like this is probably the best way to approach it, where you are actually selling core game mechanics being added into your game rather than selling just a new map with start positions, which is something, you know, modders could do, to be honest. Um, so just change the monetization strategy. It works better for consumers. It works better for the developers. And the goal is ultimately to increase the longevity of the next game and to make it great. And I can really go on about this for another hour. So with my point hopefully across, we're going to end this episode here. As I mentioned earlier, this will be a weekly series as we'll jump from topic to topic, speculating on what might be added, what might be changed, what I hope is preserved, and offer suggestions for the next Total War Three Kingdoms. And this series will be every Monday at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time for the foreseeable future until we actually receive some official news from CA about the game. And if you have any suggestions, feedbacks, or opinions about my ideas here, or want to offer a different take, feel free to comment below as engaging the community is one of the main reasons I'm doing this. Just please try to keep things civil and constructive. And hopefully you enjoyed this discussion enough to leave a like, and I will see you all next time. Bye.